go. Pulling out into the water, into the largest mangrove forest in the world. There are going to be people listening somewhere in America who will hear that and say, what are you, crazy? No, I'm not crazy. I'm just not going to subscribe to fear. It feels like a scene out of King Kong or Jurassic Park, but we're really only 25 miles off the coast of Los Angeles. And no dinosaurs. No dinosaurs, as far as you know. Yeah, as far as I know. The Mugabe era is gone, and it's something that can't um, be ever allowed to come back. And is what you're trying to do here making sure that that change stays permanent? Yes. But I really am grateful that my heart has been broken a good many times because it does help me to love. Ari Shapiro, NPR News, Rio de Janeiro. Santiago, Chile. Belgrade, Serbia. Izmir, Turkey. Traveling with the president aboard Air Force One. To them, this is just another day on the water. To me, it's a final exclamation point marking the end of my time in the UK. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the stage host of NPR All Things Considered and newly minted New York Times bestseller Ari Shapiro and NPR's Peter Sagal. Hi, Peter. Such Radio. a rare privilege to be face to face with you. I know. Speaking of face to face, welcome everybody to the evening that informally known around town as the evening with the two best looking people in public radio. <laughs> it's a low bar. It's a low bar. Here's the funny thing. Uh, I, I, I made that joke and then I realized that if you were to actually average us, right? Maybe using one of those like meme generator things on whatever to combine our faces it would still be the best looking person in public radio. You know. Him I, minus me, still better than Kai Rizdahl. That's well, what I'm saying. Before Audie Cornish left for CNN, that's true. she would have been but a real that's contender the for thing. the title. She knew. She yeah. got out and got a career in TV. And Look, you there's stuck more with to a career than a face, you know? That's why <laughs> I went into radio. I didn't want to be judged on this. Neither did I. This, we have so much in common. This is fleeting. I was so <laughs> tired of people thinking I was shallow because I was beautiful. Right? Right? Yes. It's hard being pretty, it's, isn't it, it Peter? It's, it's tar It's just, <sighs> you know, people, I just, God, I I really just want to say to people, look, my brain is up here. You just. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> there are not many people who I feel like I can <laughs> genuinely, honestly talk about this with. It's terrible. Let alone in front of hundreds of people I've never met before. Yeah, I know. It's it's so hard. I mean, I can't even go to the gym anymore, frankly, um, <laughs> which is why I... I never like went. This. I just did parkour. <laughs> I can see this is not going to go It's at funny all. because it's true. How <laughs> you really, you, that's, you came to, and you did parkour? That's how you spent your day? Well, not today. I mean, I did, park, I did a lot of parkour in my 20s. There's a passing Again, reference to parkour. something else we have in common. <laughs> There's a passing reference to parkour in the book because the dinner party where the, the like set the whole pink martini thing into motion, some parkour trainers were at that dinner party from my gym and they were literally scaling the side of my house and my husband looked at them like climbing into the second story window and then he looked at me and think you know he's a lawyer so he was thinking about the the health and safety hazards he looked at the parkour trainer climbing the building he looked at me and he said this is why we'll never have children <laughs> that was the reason that's the reason <laughs> he was like if you will let people literally scale the exterior oh, of I the see. house without a net without a helmet without signing a waiver i that cannot could. trust you to co-parent <laughs> a, a human I, I have a list of questions here because I know how much you like interviewers with lists of questions, but I, I, what's the point? But I'll start. I'll try. I'll try. <laughs> uh, you, you and I, uh, weirdly enough, and not joking quite as much, have a lot in common um, yeah. in that we both grew up Jewish in the suburbs, more or less in my case. One of the things, or your case, I should say, one of the things that's, that a lot of people have commented on is that your first seven or eight years were in Fargo, North Dakota. Yeah. Uh, and I, God, I can see the Fargo all over you. Um, you know, I was in Minneapolis for 12 hours yesterday. Yes. And as I was at the airport restaurant having dinner, and somebody was like was moving their back, and I was like, "Oh, you're fine." And oh. I was like, "Oh my God, 
like literally where did that come from? <laughs> I'm not kidding. It's it just came back. Happened. It's just it's like weird. <laughs> You started Sorry, you were asking a question. Central Midwest I'm again. really not trying to derail I know, this, I swear. I it's know. just so nice to chat with you, Peter. It's very nice to okay, chat with you. Suburban Jews. Suburban Jews. Fargo, we're North two, Dakota. We are two people who interview other people for a living, so neither of us are ever going to stop talking. <laughs> um, I just love not having to think about what question is next. I just... Oh, I'm sorry. Take no, the I reins. Have to. Okay, yes. Be the, <laughs> the dom top. Yeah, and you, the, I, I love... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> We're all just gonna have to wait till that image is passes <laughs> from our minds. <laughs> just let it float uh. out into the ether and we begin again. <laughs> the story you tell, and I cannot, because I grew up in the Jewish suburb of, of New Jersey, that you and your brother or brothers <laughs> were asked at Christmas to go around the elementary school and explain what Hanukkah is yeah. to all the good goyim of Fargo. <laughs> and I actually don't know if the school asked, or if it was our parents' idea, or if we volunteered. Oh, I, I hold on, I just want to give props. He spelled goyim right up there. <laughs> I was wondering. Um, he must be mishpocha. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, go on. We, it, I was like in the first grade, yeah. and... What, you don't want to type mishpacha? <laughs> all right, all right. We, 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 this, I, I've had experience with this kind of, and we oh, will. Oh, bravo. <laughs> so, <laughs> I would go By from. The, at this point, <laughs> we are going to make it in the hour to page six. <laughs> I would go from classroom to classroom with a menorah and a dreidel explaining what Judaism is and what Hanukkah is to other first, second, and third graders. And my older brother would do the same with the fourth, fifth, and sixth graders. And th the reason I put this in the book is that I, I realized that this was sort of my first experience trying to make something foreign feel human and relatable and understandable for a group of people that might have seen it as different and obscure and maybe even a little scary. And spoiler alert, this is a recurring theme yes. <laughs> throughout the narrative. Uh, uh, so since you've done that, could you explain Hanukkah now? Because I've never gotten it. I, it's basically I like most of the Jewish holidays. They tried to kill us. We won. Let's eat. <laughs> In this case, it's fried food for Passover. It's unleavened food. You know, the specifics vary, but it's they tried to kill us. We won. My understanding eat. was uh, like my generation or maybe my parents were growing up in America to immigrants and they were looking around in December saying, how come they get presents and we uh, don't? Yeah. And the Jewish, <laughs> the Jewish people had to come up with something quickly. Um, but in Fargo, my parents would, like my mother would make challah every Friday night. She would make matzo ball soup. We got our kosher meat delivered on a freezer truck from Chicago once a month. Chicago? They, they were actually, oh yeah, from this very city. Um, there were actually two synagogues in Fargo in those days. You know the most famous Jewish joke in the world, of course. I do, but yeah. I want you to tell it. Okay, so the, this Jew gets stranded on a d desert island. Years later, he's rescued, and he's giving his rescuers a tour of everything he's built on this island. And there's like a whole town, and he shows his rescuers, like, here's the city hall, and here's the post office I built, and here's this synagogue, and then there's the other synagogue. And his rescuers are like, wait, 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 wait. You're the only person on this island. Why are there two synagogues here? And he says, that one I would never go to. Do you know that something like that actually happened? Where? This must have been in the early 2000s after our so successful, and I'm surprised you don't know about it because you've been there, invasion of Afghanistan. And there was a story about the last two Jews in Kabul. Whoa. That Wait, did Guy Raz do this story? It, this is ringing it, it, a vague It sounds bell. vaguely like him. Uh, he doesn't take my calls anymore. He's too wealthy. <laughs> but, but the story was that these two, there had been a Jewish community, as there had been so many places, but of course they had been driven out by all the various troubles of various kinds. And there were two left, and they each, uh, ironically enough, had the, the job of maintaining two small synagogues that were still left. Wow. And somebody asked them, they said, why, why do you bother keeping up these two synagogues if there's only two of you left? And they said, 
I can't stand that guy. I would never go. It's like a Dave Eggers it, novel. I feel like he should adapt it for, or a, or a Guy Raz report on NPR, or, maybe. You know, or a Woody Allen routine from the early days. Um, all right. So you you had to you had to explain about what it was like to be a Jew to the good the good people of uh, no, not of Fargo. So good ones. Eh, all of them. Then you moved to Portland, and you went to a suburban high school while living in the city. And and what's interesting again to me is uh, we have certain similarities so far. We were both theater kids, right? Uh, in the gifted and talented program. God forbid. Which brings me up, I did want to ask you, and I did talk to his brother, who I'm friendly with, if you could tell everybody about the fairy garbage mother. Oh, God. That's a deep cut, Peter. That is a deep cut. Okay, so one of my extracurricular activities was called Odyssey of the Mind, which is a terrible name for an actually incredible program, which was a creative problem-solving competition. And so you would create a performance sketch with your five to eight person team that you would work on for months that was your long-term problem solving and then there was what was called the spontaneous problem solving where your team would go into a room and they'd be told like name things you can do with a stick and you have two minutes to list off as many things as you can come up with so our sketch in the sixth grade involved the fairy garbage mother I think it had something to do with Garfield the comic strip this is like deep from the recesses of my brain. But we had this huge puppet that like rose out of a garbage on a pulley and we like operated its hands. This competition took us to the world finals of Odyssey of the Mind, I will have you know, which were called the world finals, I think, because there was maybe one team from Canada that came over the border. Um, but, but I actually think of all of the various extracurricular activities that I and my brothers did as Random as it sounds, I think Odyssey of the Mind was sort of the most helpful because the idea of creative problem solving and the skills that you build in figuring out how to adapt to open-ended challenges, like those are skills that I use every day, but I think people in most fields can use them every day. And I, I did it for many years, OM, and we had different sketches every year, but the very first one we ever did featured the fairy garbage mother. It's true. And you won the state championship. And we won the state and went on to world finals, yeah. In, in Iowa. Like I said. Which was, at, yeah, yeah, Ames, Iowa. Ames, Iowa, where else? Uh, you write, and again, this, is, this, this continues the theme of your, trans, your passing between worlds, translating one world to another. Uh, you came out in high school, and, and you said you didn't do it with a lot of hesitation or a lot of drama. You were just like, oh. Or a lot of experience, frankly. Right. <laughs> uh... I okay. just thought, like, I'm going to have to do this sooner or later, and the sooner I do it, the sooner it'll be a non-issue and I can get on with my life. Just, you know, rip off the Band-Aid, move on with it. And, and that, and, and, and just, as, just to put this in time, because things have changed, maybe not permanently, but they've changed m for the better. I graduated from, I'm older, I graduated from high school in 1983, um, and at that time, we had gay kids in high school, of course, some of whom are now very happily married and living wonderful open lives as themselves, but there was no chance in hell they could have come out in a suburban high school in 1983. I don't know of anybody who came out in my suburban high school prior to, I graduated in 96. The difference was, so, th like, we weren't aware of gay teens in my high school, but Portland, Oregon had what I think was at the time the only all-ages gay nightclub in the U.S. It was called The City. And so on weekends, after I came out, I would go to the city nightclub and like I would meet kids who were like me. And the other thing that was different was that a few years before I came out, there was a statewide ballot measure in Oregon that would have prohibited state funds from being used to encourage, and then there was a list. And the list included homosexuality, pedophilia, bestiality, and necrophilia. So the consequence of this bill, had it passed, would have been that like teachers could have been fired for being gay and so on and so forth. But the consequence of the debate over the bill was that like people at my school were taught that homosexuality was on par with child abuse. Which is why it feels so strange to me now to hear people use the word groomer, because I feel like that was a debate we were having in the 90s that I thought was long since put to bed. But when I came out, it was like these abstract arguments that everybody in my school had been having were suddenly about me specifically. And I was very 
I was going to say open, but like brazen. Like I put a pink triangle pin on my backpack. I plastered my locker with pictures of mostly naked men. I was, I was, I came to school in drag for Halloween. And so like everybody was having these debates about gay people that suddenly like zeroed in on debates about me. And then I would, you know, go to the city nightclub on the weekends and just dance with my friends. W were you the only out gay kid in your high school? Yeah. Was that lonely? Was that isolating? Did you, I mean, well, you, you had this under, other wonderful, I won't say life, but aspect of your life. That yeah, you, you might on. be surprised to hear this, but I actually don't mind attention. Ah. <laughs> and so getting a lot of attention as the only gay person in the school. Hold on, I'm processing that. Really? <laughs> it was not always a pleasant experience. Like, there was a, I remember a football player offering to defend me if anybody, like, threatened me. And now I'm like, was he flirting with me? Yes, yes. <laughs> I was a little bit oblivious at the time. But then also people did threaten me. And, like, I carried mace. But I didn't get beaten up. I didn't ever actually have a physical confrontation. So, like, you know, there were highs and lows. But ultimately, I sort of felt like, once again, I was helping people understand something that might have seemed abstract and foreign and scary and unfamiliar, and I was like, no, you know me, so now you know a gay person, so whatever feelings you might think you have about gay people, well, how do you feel about me specifically, which is a different kind of a conversation. Right. And I, I know this comes up again, and we're talking about your journalism and the story you tell about the Pulse nightclub and your marriage, but did you consider yourself at that time an activist? Were you, were you like political? Did you think of yourself as being out there for the cause? There was the no cause? option of not being political if you were gay. Like, your identity was inherently politicized. The act of being an out gay person at school was an incredibly political act whether you wanted it to be or not. And so it didn't feel like there was any act of choice that one needed to make after that. It was like, the choice of being out in high school was like, you are, I, I mean, I sort of imagine that trans people living in states today where trans healthcare is being outlawed may feel the same way. Like, it, it's irrelevant whether you want to be a trans activist or not. Your existence is being politicized. And as a gay teen in high school, like, my very existence was politicized. And therefore, there was no choice of, like, are you going to see yourself as an activist? Everybody, you know, was debating my right to exist. So put me there whether I wanted to be there or not. I know one of the things that you've said, because I've been, I've been l following your book tour. Oh, I'm sorry. Did, did, did we, we did discuss that as of today, he is the author of a New York Times bestseller, right? And I... That is so wild. And, I and just I think, found out like two hours I ago. I know, and I, it's obviously because it happened on the day that he was appearing with me, so I'm going to take credit. Can I just tell you something funny about this, this uh, like not to derail the conversation again, but I've been learning all these things about the publishing industry over the <laughs> course of this. So apparently what happens is on the, what is today, Wednesday before the list comes out, yes. some people in the publishing houses get the list and plastered all over it is do not publish, do not duplicate, do not share. And it is part of the accepted tradition that in that moment, everybody publishes and shares and duplicates it. And like, I'm a journalist, so I know what that means. And I was like, is it really okay for me to post this thing that says all over it, do not post, do not publish, do not duplicate, do not share? And they were like, yes, this is how it's done. So yeah. I shared it on social media. Strangely, I never learned that when my book came out. Anyway. <laughs> Uh, and, and I was interviewed by you about it, so clearly you don't clearly, have my clout. Clearly, I'm not as influential as Apparently, you are, Peter. Uh, An interview I'm sorry. with you does the I, trick. What I was going to say a few minutes ago was that because I've been listening to you, you've, I know one of the things you talk, a, a personal, uh, what's the word, um, uh, irritation about interviews sometimes is people who just stick to the list of questions. So I'm going to skip ahead. Love it. Um, and this was, I was saving this for later. We've been talking about you're being out in high school, you're talking about the political act, and then you made reference, you made, you made two references which were important, which were this whole conversation about grooming, which you remember from the 80s, 90s, I remember from even earlier, that was a constant theme of, of uh, homophobia. Um, and now we also made reference to the anti-LGBT, specifically trans laws that are going on to an astonishing, head-spinning uh, degree and pace. So, looking around, 
how do you see that? We have had such, in my lifetime, and yours, such advancement in terms of gay rights, legally, civilly, and socially, and now there seems to be a retrenchment or maybe a reaction. What's your sense of it? I think, first of all, assuming that progress is permanent is a mistake. Progress is never guaranteed. Also, when I was a kid, I saw no examples of gay stories ending happily. What I was taught was that if you're gay, your story will end in tragedy, whether you're dying of AIDS or staying closeted your whole life or whatever the case may be. And now, despite all of the battles that we're seeing all over the country, there are as many different kinds of examples of gay stories as there are human experiences. And that's not about a specific policy such as LGBTQ people being allowed to serve in the military or being allowed to marry or any of the other specific things. But when you take the totality, life is fundamentally completely different from when I was a teenager, and that's a good thing. And also, you can't get apathetic about it. And you have to recognize that one's right to exist is not promised and guaranteed. And when there is rhetoric that says gay people are groomers, you can't just brush that off as something like wackadoo fringe person on the margins because then suddenly there's legislation saying books should be banned or healthcare should be outlawed. I mean, like, this is, this is real backsliding that I'm surprised to see, um, but it doesn't mean that things are the way they were when I was a teenager. Yeah, I'm, I'm gonna keep following this thread and I, I, we can get back to the biographical notes I was interested in. Um, th there, one of the things that is of great import right now is the notion of objectivity in journalism. Uh, you as a prominent journalist, um, obviously are very tied up in this and you know NPR audiences have very strong feelings about it. When it comes to something like this issue, which we've just been discussing, this remarkable backsliding and hostility to the rights of LGBTQ people, do you feel that this is an issue, both personally or professionally, that you need to, as so many people demand that we do, in your field, I should say, in mine, not so much. Yes, Peter, more fart jokes. Um, <laughs> that you need to take a side, that you need to, to if not be unobjective, define objectivity differently. objectivity differently, yes. So I have a few thoughts and none are simple answers. One is that I think objectivity is relevant to any conversation about journalism and I also think we carry our identity and our history and our own stories with us when we go out as journalists and we have to hold both ideas in our mind. And my identity is not just as a member of marginalized groups, as a Jew, as a gay man, my identity is also as a white person, as a cis man, as you know, these are parts of my identity as much as the parts that belong to marginalized groups. And one of the things that I think we've realized as journalists is that there is no such thing as a lack of identity. And so the view from nowhere was always a myth. And, and so that's one piece that like, even as we acknowledge our personal identity and history that we carry with us that shapes our storytelling, we also have to allow the listener to put themselves in our shoes, imagine that they are talking to the person that we are talking to, who they may never get a chance to meet. And so in that sense, we have to be kind of a cipher and a surrogate. When it comes to the question of whether I have to like weigh in, take a stand, issue an opinion, I feel like my role is not to influence, but to illuminate. And I want NPR listeners and my audience and readers to better understand what is happening and where people are coming from and how the human experience looks and feels in their lives. And so it's not that I'm saying, well, I feel this way about that, but I'm gonna hide it and conceal it. Yeah, like, I'll give you a specific example. Um, after <clears throat> President Trump gave a State of the Union address where he said we're gonna end HIV in America by a certain year, I went on a reporting trip to the place that has the highest HIV infection rates in the country, which is Mississippi. And it's mostly among black men who have sex with men. So I got to Mississippi with my producer. I downloaded a meetup app called Jacked that's mostly used by men in Mississippi. I made a profile that said, I'm a reporter. I'm looking to talk to people about HIV. Went out and talked to a lot of people and then booked an interview with the state lawmaker 
who had sponsored a law allowing doctors to deny care based on moral ethical objections. So they would have been able to deny care for HIV or whatever if they objected to homosexuality. Now, you can imagine how I feel about that lawmaker's stance, but in my conversation with him, I wasn't trying to show him why he was wrong. I wasn't trying to convince him or demonstrate to our listeners that he was dumb or misguided. I really wanted to know where he was coming from. I was really sitting down to talk to him out of curiosity and inquisitiveness and like a desire to illuminate and understand. And in that sense, like, you know, I get as much of a thrill out of Jon Stewart's viral videos as the next person, but what I'm doing is something slightly different than that. And I think what I'm doing is important in the same way that defense attorneys representing whoever the client may be is important. Like, they are not there to defend the people who they like or agree with. They are there because they believe in the importance of defense lawyers to the legal system. And I believe in the importance of journalism to a democracy. And so, when I go out to tell those stories, I'm not trying to, like, you know, nudge people in a particular direction. I'm truly trying to illuminate rather than influence. Obviously... A lot of people appreciate that and believe in it. I, I think if you were to force me, I would, I would believe in that approach and what you do. I mean, John Stewart does what he does, and we don't need another person doing it. We don't need another MSNBC. It's there when you want it. But I, I want to push back because this is something that roils, I think, a lot of the criticism of the media and journalists, which is that if I can, if I can summarize the argument, it's like in normal times, what you're talking about is great. Um, uh, but this, these are not normal times. Uh, that while a journalist should not necessarily ever take a position of like higher capital gains rates, lower capital gains rates, like Medicare for all, private insurance. These are political issues on which they obviously should say objective. But when it comes to human rights issues, like you just brought up, or issues of democracy itself, that there is a call, and I know you've seen it, I get it, and like I said, I'm not in the news side, for journalists to take a side. To, to advocate for basic ideas of democracy, free speech, et cetera. Um, and what do you think, I mean, I think you've just said in, in that very specific instance, but in the threats that, well, among other things, journalism itself are under, not to mention the larger, the larger world, do you think that there is some responsibility to change the approach? I think one of the things we've learned over the last five years or more is the importance of calling a lie a lie, the importance of creating a truth sandwich. So if you're gonna say, President Trump claims he lost, he won the 2020 election, you will, before that statement, say, you know, despite dozens of courts saying that Biden won the election, Donald Trump claims he won it, which is a false statement. Like, we create a true sandwich, so on either side of the lie, you have a true statement. I think it's not on us to advocate for XYZ, but I think we have to clearly show that the insurrection was not just storming the Capitol, it was an assault on democracy. Like we have to use words and choose them carefully, and we have to not be sucked in by the kind of slippery games that people can play. And, and to continue with the Mississippi example, for example, just to return to that, like when I was interviewing that lawmaker who pushed the um, moral conscience, whatever, clause for doctors, at some point he said to me, well, I mean, it would be one thing if there was a daily pill that could prevent HIV infection, but, and I said to him, there is. It's called Truvada. It's more effective than condoms at preventing HIV transmission. And, like, it was important that I say that. I wasn't just going to be like, well, if it's your opinion that there's no pill that you can take, like, it, the journalist has to not just create space for any ideas to flourish. There has to be a loyalty to truth, and when there is an assault on democracy, we have to say that. I mean, the question of human rights, I think, is actually more challenging because how do you define human rights? I've had fascinating conversations with Sarah McCammon, who is our correspondent who covers reproductive rights and does an amazing job at telling thoughtful, detailed, nuanced, human stories, and still has people on both sides of the debate willing to talk to her because of 
what a good job she does covering these issues. And it is incredibly difficult work that she does incredibly well. And I would love to hear her weigh in on this. I mean, I've sort of talked with her offline about it. But yeah, it's very, very difficult. And there's n often not like a clear black and white, a journalist should do this, shouldn't do this. But there has been a learning curve, I think, over the last five years. And I think we've changed. We, we've only got a few minutes before we move to your questions. And so I'm going to ask you one more heavy question. And then we get one more visit to the fun stuff. Um, of which there is a lot in his book, let me assure you. Um, you have been, as your book details, all over the world. You have been to places with actual civil wars uh, or places where uh, sectarian violence has been extreme. You've been, been to places that are under actual authoritarian governments. And as you know, there is quite commonly in this country a great fear that that's where we are headed. There are people, not just Twitter commentators, but authoritative voices who look into this who think that we are headed toward civil violence. There are people who believe that the threat of authoritarian government in the United States is quite real and we're closer than we might know. As someone who has seen it for real, as opposed to sitting at home looking at Twitter, can you, do you have an informed opinion about how much danger we're in, how close we are, or how unusual these times are for us here in America? Yeah, I, I mean, <clears throat> I'll begin by saying I never try to predict the future, even at home with my husband in private, even in my, like, I'm never weighing in on who I think will win a presidential election or whether I think, like, it's just not in my DNA. But having had conversations and done interviews with people who study this, there are a few things I can say. There is an anti-democratic tide sweeping the world, truly from Asia to Europe, to the Middle East, to the Americas. This is happening for a lot of different reasons, but these things that sweep the world, the US is not immune to. So that's one point I would make. I mean, you know, Israel, which is widely viewed as the strongest democracy in that part of the world, is now looking at a potential backslide towards a sort of Poland-Hungary style, anti-democratic, I don't want to say autocracy, but certainly moving in that direction. And so I think nobody's immune from that. It could happen here, it could happen anywhere. And then the other person who I often think about is the New Yorker writer Masha Gessen, who I interviewed at some point about their book, Surviving Autocracy. And they had a framing that I thought was really helpful. Masha said, democracy is not a fixed state. It is not an either or, you are a democracy or you not, or you aren't. Every country is always in the process of becoming more democratic or less democratic. And so rather than look at this as, are we still a democracy? Can it be saved? Have we become autocratic? Is it too late? It's more useful to say, are we becoming more democratic or less democratic? And as you look at states that are passing laws to disenfranchise voters, which outnumber the states passing laws to, for example, give people who have been released from prison on felony after serving time for a felony conviction, re-enfranchising them and giving them the right to vote. When you look at the trends happening across the US, there's no question the US is becoming less democratic. Is there a moment at which the US becomes an autocracy? Are we gonna reach that moment? Those are questions that I can't answer, but I'm not even sure how useful it is to try to, because inevitably that's kind of a crystal ball question and people are gonna disagree on the answer. But I think it is useful to say, over the last few years, the United States has become less democratic. All over the world, we are seeing trends towards autocratic leaders and anti-democratic ideals, and the United States is not immune from those trends. But this is a really uplifting and well, no. book. Well, no. I was trying this to come up with a funny optimism. Well, this is what I'm gonna do. This is what happened. <laughs> so my plan was we're gonna go to the heavy no, stuff because no. I'm genuinely curious because you know a lot more than I do about any of this. But then I wanted to come back to some of the fun stuff from your book and your life. I sadly have used up too much time. So no, I, I used it chit chattering away. You did but about to, but silly, to great silly effect, things. To great effect. So I have to give you a choice of the two things I wanted to end with. You can either tell us about the radical fairies, or you can sing. I know what they want. I think the audience has voted. Yes. All right. Well, if I have one regret about my Fresh Air interview, yes. it is this. I'm sorry. I just want everybody <laughs> to just frame and think about that sentence. 
If I have one regret about my fresh air interview, <laughs> sit with that for a second. Now proceed. So Terry asked me, we're on a first name basis, Terry and I. Of course you are. <laughs> Terry asked me to give her the verse. So Alan Cumming and I do this cabaret show together. And for the show, I rewrote the lyrics to You're the Top by Cole Porter. And there's one verse that refers to all things considered. And Terry was like, will you tell us the lyrics to that verse? Will you sing them? And I was like, okay, but I can't just start there. I have to like get there from the beginning. And so I was like, you're the top. And my regret is that I'm very proud of those lyrics. And I wish I had really been like, Terry, I'm going to give you these lyrics with time to consider them and really think about the genius of the rhyme scheme and the meter. And instead, I sort of like hustled through the first three verses, and then I was like, okay, now we got to the one you asked for. So this is my do-over with you, Peter. And Ari Shapiro, this, the, the, uh, the stage is yours. Let's hear it. All right. So it begins, I sing to Alan first. You're the top. You are joie de vivre. You're the top. You're a Broadway diva. You're a graceful swan. Your name is on a bar. He owns a bar called the Club Coming. It's all in the book. You are wild and frisky, a Scottish whiskey, a movie star. OK. Then he sings to me, you're the top. You leave haters cursing. You're the top. You're taller in person. I was Mr. Floop, but you get the scoop, you pop, and if Ari, I'm the bottom, you're the top, you think we're done, but there's more. <laughs> we haven't even gotten to the All Things Considered reference yet. So then we modulate up a half step, and I sing to him, I'm so proud of these and really happy I can share them with you. <laughs> you're the top, you're a vegan dinner, because he's vegan, you're the top, you're a Tony winner, Two, actually. You are cabaret, a Shakespeare play, a dream. You're the Oxford comma, a network drama, your self-esteem. And then he sings to me, you're a star, your career is glittered, you'll go far, you're all things considered. <laughs> An effete aesthete a garden's bumper crop. And if baby on the bottom, you're the top. Ari Shapiro. Thank you so much. <laughs> it's even better with Alan. I'm sure it is. We did it at Ravinia a couple summers ago. I'm sorry I missed it. It was just when we were coming out of COVID and I think people were still a little bit cautious. Appropriately so actually, because at the end of that tour, we all got COVID. <laughs> I was just going to say, I had Alan on my show and interviewed him. He Strangely, he didn't invite me to do a cabaret show. I wonder why. You know what Alan knows always I'm says about his act. interviews with Terry? He said this in his book, so I'm not spilling secrets here. He says Terry's obsessed with his armpit hair. <laughs> what? <laughs> well, when, when Alan Cumming yeah, says the, the that Terry Gross, Gross is obsessed with his armpit hair. The preeminent literary interviewer yeah. of our time. Yeah. Is he wrote this in his, his book, Alan's so this is public hair. information. You know, there were... Um, ads for cabaret where Alan had like his head draped over his hand draped over his head like this and I and you know it was like this weird strappy kind of bondagey thing he was wearing and I don't know I guess Terry asked him some questions about his armpit hair so <laughs> but that's between the two of them I don't I'm not and I'm not gonna us. take sides between Alan and Terry that is oh my that god is a Sophie's we have, choice we have we have gone too long but we do want to make sure that you have some opportunity to ask some questions of Ari uh, we have people who are here with microphones, you can see them down front. So raise your hand and we'll find you uh, and we'll hear some questions. We'll start right here in the front. Go ahead, please. Hi, um, I love the interview with Terry Gross. Let me Thank just say you. that. And I wish that you would have sung Fanis Madi, if that's the correct pronunciation that's it, of it. That's it, yeah. Okay, however, my question is, um, it seems as if the LGBTQ community has had a lot of advances, but except for the trans community, which scares me. And it seems, and of course, everyone here is just horrified what happened in Nashville, but over and over and over, the shooter has been described as trans. 
And does that seem to be purposeful? Does that seem to be some sort of an agenda to... You know, I'm going to give you an answer that is probably dissatisfying, but it's entirely honest, which is, for the first time in my life, I am taking a sabbatical from NPR in order to... This is not a, like a... It's, it's just like I, I, I'm taking a couple months unpaid to do the book and to do to tour with Alan. We're doing our show at the Cafe Carlisle for a couple weeks. And part of the gift I'm giving myself of being on sabbatical is seeing that there is a school shooting and deciding not to immerse myself in the news of it. And so I'm aware of what you're saying, but I haven't covered the reporting on it enough to have an informed opinion about how the shooter is being described, which I realize is like a privilege and a luxury that I'm giving myself at this moment. But having spent more than 20 years sort of reporting on some of the terrible things that happen in the world on a regular basis, I'm not gonna begrudge myself the decision to sort of distance myself from some of the terrible things that are happening during this moment when I'm taking a step back from the news. We have a question over here. By all means. <clears throat> So this is actually for both of you. Um, so we, you were talking about um, objectivity in journalism and um, legislation against LGBTQIA people and um, a, move, a global movement away from democracy. And both of you mentioned how this is not normal times. And I was born in 1988 and I don't find any of my times to be normal. <laughs> so I'm just wondering what you consider to be normal times, because the times before Did I me, use the phrase normal times? <laughs> you both did, yes. Really? <laughs> and I, I'm just wondering, because the times before me, I don't think anybody yeah. wants to I, be normal. I, I, uh, I, I, <laughs> we are not here for me, and I, I will let Ari take it, but I, I, I will say that one of the things that I've been very invested in, in sort of my off time for my own show, which is of course about very different kinds of topics, is, is trying to pierce that illusion that things before now were normal or nicer or, you know, the way, remember how it was used to be you all got along. And I've come to the understanding through some difficult study, including understanding about the way I was taught, that things, if things are different now, it's mainly because a lot of things that have always been there are now far more out in the open. And, and that is the difference, as opposed to, oh, how'd everybody get so mean? No, but that's my feeling. I, I don't think that things were normal in, I think, the sense that you meant. I'm sorry if I said so. Yeah, I, so what you say reminds me of something that I often think of that the um, incredible writer and performer Taylor Mack once told me. I don't know if you're familiar with Taylor Mack. Um, Taylor was a finalist for the Pulitzer Prize for a show called A 24-Decade History of Popular Music, which told the American story from 1776 to 2016 when it was first performed over 24 hours. And so each hour was one decade, and it was a performance that changed my life. I could go on and on and on about it. But I said to Taylor, when you tell the story of the country through slavery and the Trail of Tears and Japanese internment camps and on and on and on, and you see this all in context, what's the larger lesson that you take away? And Taylor said to me, these things go in cycles, and I don't know why, but they do. But as you tell these stories, you also find the stories of people who are trying to make life better for those around them. And all you can hope to do, all you can hope to be, is to be one of those people in whatever time and whatever place you're living in. So to me, that's sort of the mission. That's the focus. That's, Taylor also says comparison is an act of violence. And maybe saying this is or is not normal is an act of violence in comparing this time to other times. And so I think all any of us can really hope to do, as Taylor said, is be one of those people who tries to make life better for those around them in whatever time, in whatever place, in whatever context we find ourselves. We have our next question over here. Thank you. Hi, Peter. Hi, Ari. Hi. Thanks for being here. Ari, I haven't read your book yet, but I've heard 
a lot of your stories about your uplifting experiences and these amazing things you've done around the world, but can you talk about an experience you had that just rocked you, where like you had to go home and like have a cry and like recover from it, where like for the other journalists in the, in the building, where you know, we're told to just remove ourselves from the experience and like we're not involved, but then like something happens, you have to go home at night and like recover from the story that you just covered today. How do you recover from that? And can you t tell the story about what might have happened? Yeah, I think whoever's telling you to remove yourself from the experience and not be human and not feel your feelings is totally wrong. And whoever's telling you that, I would take issue with. Um, I think we have to bring our humanity to the stories we tell. I think we have to be active listeners. I think we have to engage. And that means sometimes engaging emotionally. I have never found myself emotionally overcome in the moment of reporting. For me, it is always later when I'm listening to the story and I hear it on the air and that's when it hits me. And so, excuse me, one specific example was I did a whole project about Venezuelan refugees making their way through Colombia as Venezuela's economy was imploding. And there was this 250 mile route from the border to the capital city of Bogota the people were walking on foot. And so my team and I spent several days sort of tracing this route from the border to Bogota, telling the stories of people along the way. And then it was only when the story was on the air that it really hit me emotionally. And there's sort of a big picture and a small picture answer to how do you deal with that. The big picture answer is, I think what we're doing as journalists is valuable and important, and it's different from what aid workers are doing. And aid workers are there doing also valuable and important things. If we're at the scene of a mass shooting or a natural disaster, ER doctors are there, FEMA is there, and the journalists are there to do something that is also important and different. And being there to tell the story, being there to document what's happening, being there to illuminate the experience of these people for an audience is something that I think needs to happen. And so big picture, I remind myself of that that even just in listening to a person who wants to tell their story in a moment of hardship, I can be performing an act of connection and healing and creating something real, even if it is just for a moment. That's sort of where the title The Best Strangers in the World comes from, this idea that even if I'm only gonna ever interact with somebody for five minutes in our entire lives, that can be a real substantive interaction. So that's the big picture. And then the small picture is, I garden, I do yoga, I run, I have two dogs who are not technically therapy dogs but could probably pass the test if it were given. I have a husband who I go home to who I love. Like there are, you know, I play the piano. Like there are things I do. I cook, I keep a work-life balance. Can I, I, there's a thing in your book that I just loved and I was reading through it again today and I loved it again. This isn't the ending but it's a great place when we get toward the ending. Could you tell everybody about the ritual you have with your husband every morning? Yes, so for more than 20 years, we have begun every morning by saying to each other, good morning, good morning. How are you? How are, how you? are you? It's a beautiful day. It's a beautiful day. And that's how we start our day. And if we're in different cities, we text it to each other. Good morning, how are you? It's a beautiful day. Good morning, how are you? It's a beautiful day. And there's a whole story behind where that came from. But I think any couple that's married for a while develops a kind of like secret, special, hidden language. And that is part of ours. And it's, you know, a way of just touching base and checking in and starting the day on the right foot. Good morning, how are you? It's a beautiful day. Um, and so it's a lot of those small things and also therapy. <laughs> Next question over here. The, the terrible clock here tells me you have time for just a couple more, so. We got one over here. Okay, go ahead. Hi, Ari. Um, I've been listening to you on NPR since pretty much you started. I don't know what year that was, but I remember you did the thing on the meth epidemic. Oh, wow, yes. That was a chapter I started writing for this book, and then I was like, you know what? This book is gay enough. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm glad you remember it. Well, you, you kind of took my theme. It could have been another good title for your book, by the way. Gay this enough. This book is gay enough. <laughs> My husband says my follow-up to this should be called The Next Best Strangers in the World. <laughs> I'm sorry, I didn't sorry, mean to we, interrupt. Please go you're on. You're taking my, the, the theme of my question away. <laughs> I, I wanted to say that it's great to hear you... Uh, how do I say this? Um, more casual? 
than you are on the air. Thank you. Where you've mentioned your husband in my memory one time on the air, and that was a, oh, by the way, I have to say that my husband works in the administration. Oh, yeah, it's a very good memory. Yeah, that was the first time I disclosed his existence. There have been other times. But generally speaking, we're not like morning show people who are chit-chatting about what we had for breakfast. So True. It's not that I'm trying to be closeted on the air. It's just that I think it's not supposed to be about me. I do have a funny anecdote, though, about... So you referenced the methamphetamine story, which was when I was based in South Florida, I did a story about the connection between gay sex, meth, and HIV, and it was 2004, and it was the first journalism prize that I ever won, but before I won the prize for it, I did some reporting at a gay sex club in Miami. Uh, there was a whole story behind how I smuggled the microphone in. Um, <laughs> <laughs> in a backpack. But then I remember I called... Excuse me, sir, would you mind speaking into this? <laughs> um, but so I called my boss after the weekend of getting great tape in the Miami Sex Club. And he said, I think you need to show that this is a national trend and not just something that's happening in Florida. So why don't you go fly to some other city and go to a sex club there. And I thought, you know, I haven't seen my grandma for a long time. <laughs> so I'm gonna go to Chicago. So I flew to Chicago, I had dinner with my grandma Sylvia, who has since passed away, and then I went to Steamworks, which, <laughs> someone here recognizes the name? And so I won my first journalism prize for a story that I reported in part from this very city of Chicago. Uh, I, we Chicagoans love a local, a local shout out, so I'm afraid we'll have to leave it there. I'm told we have a heart out. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, one thing I tell people all the time is one of the great pleasures of being at NPR, which I've been at for some time now, is, uh, is, is actually getting to meet and sometimes even become friendly with some of my heroes, and that is certainly my experience of Ari as well I as I feel many the same others. way, Peter. And so, ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much. Thank you, Ari thank Shapiro. You. you will love his book as much as Thank you love him. Thank you so him. much. Thank you so much.